So, Noel, how do you pronounce your last name, actually? I don't even say it. I just say Noel G. Noel G. Okay, then we'll simple, go with Noel yeah. G. Thank you so much for joining the <laughs> no, podcast. That's all love. Thanks for having me. I appreciate of it. Of course. And first and foremost, I want to say a big thank you to Joey and you for lining this up. Um, okay, my boy P in the house, P Funkster. Yes. <laughs> For me, this is a personal milestone. You're my 30th episode. Oh, wow. That's what's up. And oh, cool. you're particularly a big milestone, not only because you're a big name and I grew up watching your movies, <laughs> but uh, when I started the podcast, one of the biggest things that I prayed on was that God keeps my integrity because I never want to compromise myself and my beliefs to get to any kind of position. And there's been so many times in this journey of this business that I've wanted to give up and wanted to stop and, or I felt like, oh, I'm not giving the things that everyone else is giving, you know, it's such a deeper podcast, you know? Um, and to see you be a man of faith and the way you stand in your convictions and you you do so with like fearless, uh, being fearless about it, for me is super important. So I really appreciate you coming on, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you. <laughs> the pressure, the pressure. The pressure, I know, because the allergies, the well, allergies like, kicked in. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's take it. Let's take. I know it that away. wasn't said on camera, just so we're clear. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm out here in Sacramento, and the allergies done beat me up. So, yeah. like, and usually I'm hyped and I'm loud and I'm crazy and energetic, but today you're gonna get the calm version because mm -hmm. those man, I cannot deal with Sacramento weather straight up. Yeah, no, and then I seen you were in like, downtown and downtown allergies are yeah. like- Oh, it's a beast out here. Dude, I will have swollen eyes coming out of downtown Sacramento. That's what I oh. had. I had to go wash my face and allergy up and I took, I yeah, I drowned myself. In, I overdosed on <laughs> NyQuil and DayQuil and whatever else I took, allergy pills, well, vitamin C. There you go. Honey. There you yeah, go. I went the all in. Honey, there you go. I went all in. Went I was like, I need help right now. No, I hear you. Well, sorry that you're having that experience in the spring. No, Come back all, in the fall. It'll be better. That's all good. <laughs> that's all good. I just try to flow with it. Yeah. Well, tell us about your childhood. Let's take it way back. How did you grow up? Uh, yeah, so I grew up a little different. Um, up to the age of 13 years old, I didn't struggle. Nothing like that. I lived in a middle-class home. I, I was I was well off up to the age of 13 years old. I had everything. I had food on my table, clothes in my closet, toys in my room. Everything was straight. And uh, but my dad, he was a miserable guy. He hated his life. His life was work television, work television. Hated his life. Never had anything good to say to my mom or me. Beat me physically, mentally, all the the whole deal. And um, so and and we didn't grow up like you know, believing in anything, you know, it was just, yeah. we live, they live by good morals. Yeah. Don't steal, don't lie, you know, be home when the street lights are on, yeah. stuff like that. So that was, uh, you know, pretty much my childhood up to the age of 13. And, and then go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no. And so that changed. you got to cut me off. Cause no, I'll just keep it's on good. talking. It's good. I, I, I'm good. All I'm right, good. Go ahead. Um, at 13, right. I feel like that's, that's a common age that there's a shift. Right, because for me it was the same, and I think a lot of it has to do with our hormone changes, adolescence. We're finding who we are, our voice. Um, what was the pivotal moment at thirteen that you were like, okay, it's it's different? What was the shift? Yeah, so um, P Funk man, you heard this story a thousand times, but uh, anyways, my dad, he uh, worked at a at a company that was well off, mm -hmm. and the guy who owned the company was a multimillionaire. Yeah. And my dad's hobby on the side was scuba diving. He was a fisherman. So this guy who owned the company, and that was my dad's hobby on the side, so the guy who owned the company asked my dad one day, and let me back up two seconds. My parents were the only two who moved to the United States from their families yeah. to, quote, unquote, do the American dream or whatever you want to call it. So I never in my life met my mom's side of the family or my dad's side of the family. I have no brother, sister, cousin, nieces, nephew, uncle, aunt, grandma, grandpa, no, nothing. I had never met either side of the family. So I always grew up alone. And uh, I had a dog once, if that counts, yeah. and a little fish. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but long story short, um, so my dad, uh, the guy who owned this company, asked my dad one day, you want to go sailing around the world with me on this boat? Yeah. But if you come with me on this boat, you can't bring your kid with you. So my dad literally one day came home to a 13-year-old kid, gave me $500, and he pretty much said, good luck. So within a two-week time frame, I went from a middle-class home, clothes on my back, toys in my closet, uh, food on the table, everything being straight. Within two weeks, 
I went from all that to nothing but the clothes on my back, no family to call, $500 in my pocket, alone in the streets. And then that's where my real journey kind of started. In what ways did that break or build you? Well, it broke me in a lot of ways, you know, because you question why are my parents leaving? What's up? What happened? Like you're thrown in kind of, you know, this this world of like what the hell just happened, right? Yeah. <laughs> Because you're living with your parents for 13 years and then you get kind of like, I don't blame my mom, just so we're clear. Yeah. Um, my mom, she was a house cleaning lady at the time and my dad was the breadwinner. Yeah. So I, I don't blame my mom at all. My mom, I call it the two weeks of hell mm -hmm. because my mom started asking my dad, like, what kind of man are you? Who have you become? What are you doing? What's wrong with you? Like, I heard two weeks of just straight up fighting in the house. My mom was crying. She was on her knees praying, like, everything. Like, my mom bent over backwards trying to keep my dad to stay, saying, who did I marry? Like, who the yeah. hell are you? Like, And I told my mom that I have somewhere to live. I said, someone's taking me in the house. Don't worry. Go with my dad. And the reason why I did that is because if my mom would have stayed, there would have been two homeless people instead of one. And I could handle it. So my mom went with my dad, and she didn't want to go. I kind of forced her. And that was – it was like – I call it the two weeks of hell because mm -hmm. it was the most craziest time I've ever had in my life. Yeah. And um, so I started hanging out, you know, with the homies in the streets. They started gangsterizing me. I started learning how to rent cars without asking people. Mm -hmm. I got into the street pharmacy business. I like how you put that. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. so started, uh, I was a part-time mover. Me and a lot of my homies, we'd move yeah. things from like other people's houses to where we were at. And uh, I'm just playing. <laughs> we'd, we'd, I get we, you. I get yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Caught on a little later. Yeah, I did. I was like, wait, hold on. It took me a second to process that. Yeah, we were, you know, living the street life, just thugging out. And did it and bring you the comfort that uh, you thought it would? What do you mean? Like what? Like you're you're left alone, right? And you uh, you went inevitably from a young man from a young man to a, a man, right? Because you you didn't have no one else to lean on but yourself. Even to to be that age and to be able to grasp. I'm going to have my mom, I'm going to tell my mom to go with my dad because one homeless person is better than two. To be able to think of things that way, that there, there's a shift. You, you parentify pretty much yourself to take care of yourself. And you turning to the streets and, you know, getting gangsterized, as you put it, did it bring comfort to you that was filling a void because you didn't have your family? Well, I mean, I think, you know, like when you're in any situation, you just do what you can to survive and mm -hmm. live and, you know, do make the best out of the worst kind of, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it was funny because when that happened, I wasn't thinking about anything other than where am I going to sleep? How am I going to eat? Mm -hmm. And I remember it was crazy. Like um, the house that I lived in that was once furnished and had everything in there, I knew how to break in because I used to sneak out a lot. So I used to come in through the bathroom window, the sliding glass door. Mm -hmm. So a house that was once furnished, I used to sneak back into it and I would sleep in my room on the carpet because there was nothing in there for like a month. Yeah. And then one day I went in there and uh, there was a telephone that was hooked up in the kitchen and I picked it up and there was a dial tone and I said, oh, someone's moving in. Yeah. Now it's time to bounce. You know what I'm saying? But I didn't really think of it the way you're saying it, just for the fact that, you know, when you're there, you're there. You yeah. just do what you do and, you know, you Survival. just... Survival. So you just survive, yeah. <laughs> however you survive. Yeah. You know, I remember I was eating breadsticks from Olive Garden, a dollar twelve. I still remember the price to this day for six breadsticks, and uh, twelve breadsticks. I think it was six or twelve. Yeah. That I forget, but it was a dollar twelve. I remember that because I always had that money trying to get the breadsticks. Yeah, I was living off of Olive Garden breadsticks for the longest time, but um, well, those are good breadsticks. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm mad. <laughs> kept me, kept me going. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but yeah, long story short, you know, you're just in survival mode at that time. And then when the homies started taking me in, started teaching me street tricks to come up on some money, and then you start coming up with your own as you catch on and get taught, mm -hmm. and then you just, you know, it goes from there. Yeah. And um, you remind me a lot of my uncle, by the way. Like, oh. hearing you talk and talking to you reminds me so much of my deal. But um, you, you're engaging in the street life. You're doing what you have to do to survive. I've followed you for a while now. Oh. You have given your life to God. Is there a surrender story? Do you have a surrender story that was a moment in your life that changed and you said, I, I can't do this anymore, I'm going to give myself to him? Yeah, um, the quick story on that, when I was 15 years old, I was homeless for two years. I met this girl, and this girl one day asked me, she said, how come you always wear the same clothes? I've never seen where you live. 
So I ain't gonna front. I broke down, I started crying, I was 15. I told her I'm homeless, what you see is what you get, this is what it is. So she was like, um, come see my dad. Her dad was a pastor for a church. Mm -hmm. So he heard my story, he took me into the family. But it was funny, cause he was like, at the time, he's like, you can live in this home, but if you live here, we serve God. And you're gonna hear the word of God. In this home, we serve the Lord. I was 15, I didn't care. I was a homeboy could have been Muslim. I would have said, let's roll. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, I just wanted a roof over my head. I don't care if you were serving God or Satan. I, I care less. I just wanted a roof, right? Yeah. But as I lived in the home, it was the first time that I ever saw order. And the first time I saw real love between a family that I never witnessed before. And so they would teach me the word of God. And that's when I surrendered my life to God when I was 15. But I ain't gonna lie, when Hollywood kicked off, I saw all the money come in and the mm -hmm. short skirts and the party, and I said, thanks God yeah. for giving me what I need, I don't need you no more. Yeah. And I went back into the streets acting like a fool, and I just, you know, my whole life for 20 years was a party. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I started wilding out. Yeah, I have a, I, my story is a little similar in the sense that when I was 16 years old, I, um, <clears throat> I was going through a lot of things at my house and you know I lived with my stepdad he didn't treat me as his own a real dad wasn't involved in my life um, I went through being molested when I was younger by a family member I was raped at 13 by a friend's older brother and I was holding this weight in my heart that really drew a wedge between me and God and it got so bad to the point that I tried to off myself and I was dead set and I can't ever explain to people what it feels like to be like I know that I don't want to live anymore and the other side is going to bring me the peace that I'm not feeling right now. And when I woke up in the hospital and God didn't take me, I remember telling myself, all right, God, if you didn't take me, then there's a, there's a reason for my life and I'm going to find that purpose. And that was the very first time in my life that I feel like I surrendered to God. And then I got myself out of depression. All these revelations started happening. I was like, okay, this is what I got to do. And I'm going to fight my depression. I'm going to get through it. And I got through it. But then much like many of us, I thought, okay, I'm good now. I'm straight. Like, I don't need you no more. It's fine. Shortly after that, it was like one domino dropped after the other of just shitty situations back to back. And I think I probably surrendered to God probably two more times after that. And the last one was the most pivotal. Have you surrendered to God more than once? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you already know the old cliche saying, you know, it's it's not a, a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah. It's a journey, blah, blah. You know, we hear all that basic stuff, whatever. But, um, yeah, I've, I've had many moments like what you had, you know what I mean? I had yeah. my ups, my downs, my back and yeah. forths. I've had all those battles, whatever. There was a time where I ain't going to lie to you, I wanted to kill myself, too. You know, when I got into a divorce with my wife, I learned a very big lesson at that time. I was down and out. I wanted to give up, but a guy told me some one time, I never forget, he said, suicide is not a way out, it's a way in, a way into hell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you gotta think of it that way. So, and the only, uh, you know, there's so many arguments with Christians on the suicide thing mm -hmm. of what people say, you know, they're not in the right mental state, of course they're not, because they're thinking about suicide or whatever have you, the hopeless, whatever, but, Here's the best way that I've heard it explained. I wouldn't want to take that gamble to find out if I was going to hell or heaven. Yeah. So as a gambling man, I would not want to commit suicide to take that gamble on a chance of not knowing where I'm going to heaven mm -hmm. or hell. That's not a gamble that I would yeah. want to take. So I, the only reason why I didn't commit suicide is because of God and God, period because I didn't want to take that gamble once again of, you know, well, yeah. let me kill myself and hope I go to hell. Yeah. Because then you hear the other battles too, where, you know, um, God doesn't give you nothing that you can't handle. Yep. You know, you got to think about that too. So that's just a very gray area. Yeah. But the best way that I explain it to people as a gambling person, I don't know if you should take that gamble because if I had to put my money on it, I think that if anyone does commit suicide, if I was just going to be straight up and answer it, I think you do go to hell. Yeah. I think you do. And, you know, but I don't know. I'm not God. Yeah. But I'm just saying if I had to give a, a straight up answer, yeah, that would be my answer. I think you do go to hell. Yeah, I, I take that approach even when I talk to, like, atheists. Yeah. And, you know, they're they're trying to find all these answers for, like, 
well, why would God do this? And why would God do that? And it's like, obviously, we don't have all the answers. We don't know what happens after after life, right? But I do believe that there is eternal life. And I do believe that that's where we go when we pass. And I always say, well, because <clears throat> atheists always like to battle me with logic, right? They're always logically telling me the reasons for not believing or having faith. And I'm always like, okay, but if we logically look at the studies that show that people of faith are happier and they lead, you know, better marriages in life and personal lives and all these things, right? And if the gamble is, okay, if you don't believe in God, you're going to go to hell or you have eternal life in, in his kingdom, logically it makes more sense to believe in him. Like if we're looking at base, looking at it based on the studies, based on just that or the other, you're right. It just makes more sense to believe in God. Yeah. Um, I learned that the hard way, though, of, of having that unwavering faith and just trusting in the battles he was giving me. Well, I don't want to say he was giving me because, honestly, it was just the cards dealt to me. And you can't change the cards that were dealt to you. Yeah. You know? No, I agree. Have you, have you sat and thought about everything that you went through in life that Im impacted you and affected you deeply? And have you forgiven it? Have you forgiven? Like, did you forgive your dad? Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, the immature side of me wanted to cuss him out and beat him up. But the mature side of me decided to forgive him and understand why he did what he mm -hmm. did. You know, I what saw What did my, that process look like for you? It was hard because my dad showed up at my doorstep. I didn't see my dad from when I was 13 years old to the age of 43, 44, somewhere in there. Oh, so I didn't see gap. him for 33, 30. And that was the only time I seen him. My mom passed away like four or five years ago. And um, she was so hooked on my dad. Why? I don't know. And uh, I guess she knew that she was going to pass and wanted to pass away with him. So one day out of nowhere, my dad, my mom just brought my dad to my doorstep. So one day, literally after not seeing him from 13 years old to like 44 or 45, somewhere in there, Literally, I just woke up one day, not even knowing that was going to happen, and he was at my doorstep. Wow. And so I just, like, hugged him and said, you know, I forgive you, and we talked as men or whatever, and I said, I just want to understand why you did what you did. It hurt me, whatever. He explained his side. I told him my side, what happened. We caught up. And uh, I even asked him, you know, if he wanted to turn his life over to the Lord. He said no. So yeah. I was like, wow. So I don't know. Hopefully someone else gets him, but... yeah. So I don't even know if my dad's still alive to this day. The only time he reached out to me again was to tell me that my mom passed away because they live in Corsica. They mm -hmm. were living in Corsica because I'm Mexican-Italian. My okay. mom's Mexican. My dad's Italian. That is saying so, the last name then. Yeah, he went. To, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So he went to Corsica. But the last time I ever spoke to my dad was on email for him to tell me that my mom passed. Wow. And ever since that day to this day, four or five years later, I haven't heard from him since. Wow. Yeah, with my real dad, um, he's popped in and out of my life. Yeah. And I always took the forgiveness approach. Obviously, when I was younger, I was like, how could you? As a parent, like, I just didn't understand. Because now I'm yeah, a parent now myself. Yeah, you don't have an myself. understanding you're, when you're young. It's you know? like, what the heck just happened? Yeah, and then as, I, as we got older, same, we had these conversations. I got a little bit more insight on how his mind works, where his mentality was. And I could understand it. I feel like I'm pretty good at understanding why people do what they do. But there was just, you know, the stubbornness. You see where people are at and, you know, you got to have discernment on if this is someone that you want to continue to invest that effort and that time and that life with, you know. Yeah. And for me personally, I had to make a choice that I was like, I can't, you know, like I, I love you, dad, as much as I could love a stranger, the love that I have for everybody, because I inevitably right. I don't know you, you know. But I still see that your mindset, your mentality, the approach that you take to life, how you view people, how you just move. I, it's a, it's almost like a liability. It, it sounds messed up to say it that way, but it's true. And the liability is, is my heart and me. And it's interesting seeing those dynamics with like biological parents. And I've gotten like, I've, oh, I've talked openly about it online and I get mixed reactions. Some people are like, you know, wait till you're a parent. And I'm like, I am a four, <laughs> you know, I'd never do my kids like this. Right. But also too, it's like some people get it because I think you reach a point in your healing where you just realize like, hey, we're adults now. I don't need you the way I needed you when I was a kid. And it's not even bad feelings, like genuinely want what's best for you. But in my life, for my peace, it, it can't be here. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I pray over him all the time. No, that's good. That's good. You I, know? I like that. I like that. I, I say everyone's an individual case. You know what I mean? Every story yeah. is different. And we all learn the way we learn through our experiences. 
and everything that we've been through. But I'm past the point now where I tell people like this, you're only going to hate me for two reasons. Cause I was too truthful with you and you couldn't handle it. Or you came up with your own reason on why you hate me mm. because I don't care anymore. I'm not there to tell people, you know, what they want to hear. I tell them what they need to hear. Mm -hmm. And the truth, it, it don't matter how soft spoken, how gentle, how nicely, how politely I say something. The truth is just the truth and the truth will offend people no matter how you say it. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I'm tired of, I consider myself like the Tupac of Christianity yeah. because I'm tired of safe conservative Christianity. That's why sometimes like I'll hear pastors at funerals and they'll be like, you know, someone who committed suicide and they'll say, oh, he's in heaven and whoop, you're not God. You don't know that. Yeah. But they'll say it because they don't want to hurt the family's feelings. Yeah. It, so just don't mention it at all. Yeah. Just speak on the lifestyle of the person or whatever. Say what you got to say, but leave that part out yeah. because you may have just lied to the family yeah. because you didn't want to hurt feelings. And God himself in God's word says that he doesn't operate off of feelings. Yeah. He, he God himself says that because if we operated off of everybody's feelings, which I think is part of the reason why the world is in the chaos that it, it's in today, because they don't want to hurt people's feelings. That's why it's become so chaotic and so mm -hmm. loose and so crazy because I don't want to offend you. Yeah. And God himself said, does this offend you? Yeah. God himself, because he came to tell the truth. No matter what you say, the truth is God's truth. I have one opinion and one opinion only. My opinion is that the Bible is real. Mm -hmm. After that opinion, my opinion doesn't matter no more. It's what God's word is. Yeah. Get what I'm saying? So. Yeah. That's why. That's why. Oh, go, go ahead. No, go. You go ahead. No, I was you just saying, that's why I get so like heated sometimes because I see like a lot of pastors play it so conservative and so safe and I'm like no nah. and that's why I gotta know the word of God yeah so I know what they're saying is real or not yeah I just made a video on Instagram the other day and I said you know this is for all my people who believe why would you expect to be liked in a world where our God was hated you know and people aren't that's good. ready I, yeah to receive that truth because a lot of people misconstrue correction with judgment. And even myself, when I was living a sinful life and I was, you know, I'm, I'm still imperfect, you know, I still have my ways. But when I was really not as transformed as I was now, when, when someone would look at me and tell me like, hey, you ain't living right. I'm like, whatever, you're just judging me. You don't know my pain. You don't know what I lived through. You don't know what I've had to deal with, you know. And we've cultivated in society. And I'm curious as to your thoughts as to how we got here, but I've noticed that we've cultivated in society this eggshell entitled group of people that don't know how to take correction and don't know how to take constructive criticism. Therefore, they take everything so personally and words are now apparently not just offensive, but um, physically damaging. You know, like I've, I've heard people say that and I'm like, what the? What are you talking about? Like sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Like what what happened to our integrity when well, it comes to that? How do you think we got here? Well, the bottom line is the number one reason is we lost God's word. We lost God's foundation. And we know that the devil will get this world bottom line straight up, straight out. And mm -hmm. it's going to be more conformed to the devil if you give into that. So he's taking out there's Christians right now being killed you know, in certain places where they have to have Bible study underground because they can't even confess or profess the word of God because they're being killed for it. And it's only a matter of time before that floods in over here yeah. where, you know, you already know that if you're living for God, you're going to be deemed as someone crazy when you don't accept the chip, the mark of the beast. Yeah. But they're going to give all their reasons of, you know, why it's good for you. You know, they're gonna, oh, it's going to yeah. stop robbery. Yeah. But if you don't comply with the government, all they got to do is turn that chip off and now you can't even go buy a cheeseburger, so you accept yeah. it under their control. And that's what the devil wants, ultimately, is control. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I'm just going to, when you know who you're dying for, who cares? Yeah. That's where I'm at, right? Yeah. And then I always think about this. When Jesus was with the disciples, one of the disciples told Jesus straight up, he said, Jesus, if we're going around town to town to town and we're, you know, where are we going to sleep? Where are we going to eat? And God said, are you not a fool to know that the birds in the air are taken care of? So you're more important than a bird. And so that's the way I see it. Like I care less what happens to me. I'm ready to lose Hollywood. I call it Hollywood, not yeah. Hollywood. 
I'm ready to lose Holly Hood over God because, like I said, if God takes care of a bird, he'll take care of me more so. Yeah. So I'm at a point where I just don't care. Yeah. And, you know, when the pressure's on, which it's about to be on, you know, we're already starting the wars going on and all these other things that are happening. And you could go down this rabbit hole as deep as you want, but we're starting to live in the signs of the times and all these things that are happening. Pretty soon you're going to be forced to make a choice, God or the devil. Yeah. And, you know, I laugh, you know, when we talk about like COVID and vaccine and don't get me started on all this stuff because I'll go deep. Oh, same. <laughs> everybody thought, oh, I didn't have a choice because I'll lose my job. No, shut the heck up. You did have a choice. Don't ever think that you do not have a choice. It's just whatever choice you make, good or bad, there's going to be consequences with that choice or this choice. Yeah. You, so I always want people to know, just don't ever think that you do not have a choice. That's yeah. a crock of crap. And I think a lot of that comes from lack of integrity with self. During that whole COVID stuff, I'll, I'll keep it 100 with you guys. I went to every store, unmasked. I just, I literally, Costco, Costco down the street from here. I remember going in there because I was, I'm, an, I'm a nerd for this kind of stuff. I can have deep conversations I'm sure we could get into. But um, we'd probably be talking for hours, no lie. But I went to my, my Costco's and they were, you know, just that whole thing. The pressure of, hey, no, put your mask on, look at your kids and that. And I said to them, I said, you know what? No. It's a good no. plan. Well, from, from like they're not even hiding it no more. Six no. feet apart, six six six. Yeah, it just yeah. A mask is a sign of slavery. Keep your mouth shut. We don't care what you have to say. You know yeah. all this stuff or whatever. And if you don't catch these signs like that, you don't see that. Then you know. And and God's very clear. God says that if you don't know His word, you'll be manipulated. Yeah. You'll be deceived. You'll be tricked. Yeah. I think it was all part of a plan to be real because nowadays people are still wearing masks. Before. You were not welcome in a grocery store wearing a mask. You were a suspect. It was like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. Now you could wear a mask and they're getting away with crime more, yeah. getting away with robberies more because a mask has become so common now we don't even question it yeah. no more. So it's easier to do crime. So yeah. that was a setup to eventually implement the chip to say we got to stop what's going on. Stop what you created, what you mean? Yeah. You got to stop what you guys started well, that's what I'm to do what you're trying to do to make and people are going to be blind to this and they're going to give in to desperation and all it's No, it's Don't get it's me going unless this podcast no. is 3 hours. <laughs> it's or it's orchestrated chaos, problem solution. Exactly. You create the problem, you have the solution. The solution is always not to our benefit and uh I think one of the biggest things that made me see through this thing immediately like immediately i was like no 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 this is this is off i i survived a domestic abuse relationship where i really thought that like this person could kill me this person could take my life and i fought through that manipulation and i had to literally observe manipulation tactics uh, mental emotional abuse spiritual abuse right that i started seeing these similarities with government like it was a, the same kind of things that I survived, I started seeing, but from government to populace. And I was like, whoa, hell no, this, this is crazy. And, and we have to stand up against it. And I think for me, it was such a trip to see how many, we look at a lot of men as the protectors of our society, a lot of, uh, you know, men that believe in God too. There wasn't many people like you that are like standing up, speaking out and you don't care. You don't care. You'll lose it all right for this conviction. I wasn't seeing that. And there was a lot of times where when I would go to Costco and I'd be the only one and there would be all these families walking by and all these men and I'm sitting here like, no, what you guys are doing is wrong. This doesn't make sense. If we can go to a restaurant and freaking walk through the restaurant with our mask and then we sit down and take off our mask to eat, like it doesn't make sense. Why are we conforming to this if it doesn't make sense? And... It, it, I lost a lot of followers when I started speaking Who about cares? this. So did I. Who cares? I literally, <laughs> my husband was like, what are you doing? Like you're building this podcast and stop talking politics and stop talking this. And I said, no, why am I going to, I'd rather die freaking on my feet than live on my knees. And, and I believe in God way too much than to conform to one, this government that I see everything about them is in essentially satanic and demonic. It, it's very occult vibes with our government with the elites with the people whoever it may be whatever y'all think it is i see the signs spiritually and when people don't have spiritual discernment because they took god out of our foundation us having these conversations we sound crazy but when you have that spiritual discernment you have the holy spirit in you and you see it for what it is it's clear as day and how do you 
wake people up to that, you know? By getting Other into it. By, no, well, God says to share his good news. You did, you're doing it now just by sharing God's good news. But I agree with everything you said except just one thing. Mm. We don't sound crazy. We're, we're in God's alignment. I think they're crazy. So the way they think we're crazy, I think they're crazy. I you like know what that. I mean? so, that gives me gas. Yeah, I'm like, nah, just <laughs> it's all good, you know? At the end of the day, we'll see, you know, who's in heaven yeah. and who's not. But that you're doing it now, you just continue to share the good news, yeah. share God's word, be a, you know, a living example of him, the best you can live for him. And, mm -hmm. you know, just let people know that, you know, I, I tell people, you know, it's funny because religion was meant to divide, conquer. It feels like a system. Mm -hmm. And if I can't keep up with the system, why am I doing this anyway? It's a personal relationship with God because, you know, you're going to have ups and downs like anybody else. Like you said, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. Um, but you know what God showed me in that? Because a lot of people always say, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. And, and I'm guilty of it myself. I say it even myself. But you know what God showed me in that is God, first of all, is not a past to sin. And you can't keep on saying I'm not perfect to keep on doing wrong yeah. and have it be okay to justify it or rationalize it. You know, because that's what a lot of people use the I'm not perfect card for. But you know what God did show me is there's championship Christians. So there's people who you say, I'm a baby Christian. Mm -hmm. So then they're like, oh, OK, cool. Well, when you're in your 10th year, you should have got it more <laughs> right than when you were in your first year. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yes. So there's some Christians out there that I call championship Christians. Like now you've been saved for so long. Yeah, you're a champion. Yes, you're not perfect. But you are living a lifestyle that demonstrates Jesus no matter what, even yeah. in your imperfection. I love that. So you're a championship yeah. Christian. You get I, what I'm saying? You know, I like that. And I like that. Uh, I like how you how you said that, how you frame that, because when I think of you, like how you said, the I'm not perfect can be used as a, a manipulation with self to, yeah. to manipulate yourself out of correction. Right. But. And remember, like, you know, if you know God's word and you really study him, you know, God even says himself, he doesn't hear the uh, prayers of a sinner. Yeah. So if he knows that your heart is not fully invested, because you can fool people all day long. Yeah. But you can't fool God. God knows your real heart. Yeah. So. Yeah. If God knows your real heart, he knows for a fact when you mean sorry, when you don't, when you're really not doing what you know you shouldn't be doing, et cetera. Yeah. And God knows, like, no, nah, this is one of my real ones. So yeah. I got her back. But right now, she's not being real. She hasn't been real lately. She has this pity story. I'm going to let her go for a little while until she strays back. Yep. Because 100%. God himself says, I don't hear the prayers of sinners. Yeah. You know what and I'm saying? And it's really uh, truly embodying him and living Christ-like. You know, I think about my walk with him and some of the things, like one of the biggest, one of the biggest things I asked for God to transform in my life is I used to have a stealing addiction. I would just steal. Like I had sticky freaking fingers I, I don't know like I my dad my dad just he showed me some things and then when I figured out how to do it I could not not do it for like my whole yeah. adolescence and I remember when I really you know I, I dropped to my knees and I surrendered to God the last time and I said please intervene transform me let me live like you use me you know prune me in my walk with you and I remember the first time I walked into a store and I did not have the urge to steal and it brought me to tears and I was like, wow, this is God right See, here. See, but like, that's what was... I'm saying. Like, that's a personal touchstone, and that's a personal moment. If people yeah. don't engage themselves, they can't have their own personal touchstones. Yeah. They can always use your story as something to guide them and help them. Because you could, yeah. it's like when someone's um, possessed, you could say, just call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. But if they themselves don't call on the name yeah. of Jesus, where they inside of them say, Jesus, yeah. help me, then the, the demon doesn't come out. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. And, and that's another thing, too, when I've, I I recently had a conversation with a girl who's an atheist, right? And uh, she posts something about God, and she tends to, like, when she posts her view, it's it's in a form of mockery. So there was this one post, and I, I had to rebuttal it. You know, usually I'm like, okay, you know, but I had to because I was like, God just gave me the juice. So we had a very constructive conversation, and um, she was talking about, uh, dang, 
freaking lost the train of thought right now when I was saying it. Get it back. Get it back. Damn, what is it? <laughs> I'm like, Lord and the devil trying to attack me right now. Get it it back. was what were you what were you saying before this? You, you were, were saying the about, atheist and you had to engage and you Yeah, got but the what juice. you were saying, because I was it was a perfect example. The championship Christian thing. No, no. We were we oh. were Oh no, surrender. It, it had to do with surrender. Because she used to be a, a believer, right? She was a Jehovah Witness. And then she was like, this was like occulty, and it, she, you know, God isn't real. She was doing all these things, and she very much still questioned, like, why, you know? And and I've always said, and I made a video about this too. Surrender is when you stop asking the whys, and you trust, and you have that faith, right? And I find that people, they they believe they surrendered. You were talking about you got to call upon God yourself. You got to ask him to transform your life. We could pray all day, but they got to want it, right? And you don't see the true transformation until you want it bad enough. And I find that sometimes when I have these conversations with people, I truly believe that in their heart of hearts, they think they surrendered. But they were still questioning and wanting to understand God's word in a logical human sense rather than like, the faith, the unwavering faith of it, it is what it is and we're going to trust it and we'll navigate through it. And I, I trust in God to show me the way and whatever's meant, good and bad, is purposeful. And um, those interactions always like astound me the most because I almost think like, I wonder if she would have wholeheartedly surrendered and not questioned it, had faith, not asked the wise, not tried to logically wrap her human mind around it, but rather just trusted the process. I wonder if her opinion would have been different. Well, it's amazing. So there's what, four or five billion people on this in this world, right? Mm -hmm. So it's amazing to think that there's that many people on this world, but yet we each all have our own thumbprint. Mm -hmm. You would think like, no, out of five billion people, there's two more people out there with the same thumbprint, but mm -hmm. there's not. Mm -hmm. So the whole point that I'm making is like, you can't teach no one their own blueprint moment with God when they accept God. Yeah. That has to be from them, from their own heart, from their own decision on their own. You can guide them. You can mold them. You can shape them. You can chisel them as much as you can to lead them. Mm -hmm. But it's like the horse, you know, you take them to water, but the horse got to drink the water itself. Yeah. They all have to have, so once they have that moment, that's where they have to begin the relationship with God. Because I remember, like, for example, when I was saved, when I first got saved, you know what the proof of it was? Mm -hmm. I was telling everybody, you got to get saved. You got to get Jesus. You gotta, it's about God. You got to get God. I was an unguided missile. Yeah. But as I got to know God, get to know his word, and got in that personal relationship with him, I became more of a guided missile. Mm -hmm. And a guided missile with a target is more effective than an unguided missile without a target. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I had to, I found out it was a better way of bringing people to God by just living for him. And when people instead were like, what's different about you? I don't get you, bro. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you don't want to go hit the club no more or smoke weed no more or drink no more? I, I don't understand what's going on with you. I mean, you really want to know? And then I would tell him, you know, like yeah. that, right? So... My whole thing was, you know, when people have their own blueprint and they get radically saved, however it happens, and people have to understand they could get saved anywhere. Yeah. Could happen in the beach, the mountaintop, their car, their shower, wherever, no matter where you're at. But um, once they get that, that's when they'll have the urge to be like, I want more of this. Yeah. Because they had their moment, their tingly feeling or whatever you want to call it. The that comes with it. Exactly, you know. And um, so that that's what I do. I just try to, like, let people understand that, you know, there, there is a God. And, the, and, and you said something earlier that I was going to touch on real quick about um, – now I got to remember what you said. <laughs> but you said something earlier, but here was the point that I was going to make yeah. to what you said. You know how you know God is real? Because one thing that you can't deny is someone's transformed a life and then giving it up to God for their transformed life. So that's how you know God's real because, you know, but it's sad though sometimes because there's people, like one documentary I saw that I just, oh, uh, just ate me up. I was loving it at the starting and then when it got to the ending, I was like, no, killed it for me. You know that story Alive where the people crash on the plane 
and then they were living in the snow for like four months oh, yeah. Yeah, and they had that. to eat each other to live. Yes. So I'll make this super short, but I was watching that documentary. They're in the snow. They're trapped in the middle of the snow. And at the whole, st- you can watch it with your own eyes and mm-hmm. see it, your, your, your own eyes. At the starting of the documentary, they're like, I never felt the peace of God. I never felt God the way that I've ever felt God before. And, you know, God really got us out of this, like saved our lives. And God was really there for us. Like we didn't die in the plane. Mm-hmm. And, and now I'm at home and, you know, but then when it gets to the ending and they show them in the house, you could see it again with your own eyes, your own eyes. They're sitting in their living rooms now at home saying, I don't feel God no more. Like, I don't know if God is real or not or what. And I ain't going to lie, you know, it got me a little irked because I was like, you're giving it all up to God in the starting. Yeah. He got you out of it. But now you're at home sitting peacefully and now you're not giving it up to God no more. But if God was alive then, he's still alive now. Yeah. So it's you who walked away from God. Yeah. Nobody walks away. Like we walk away from God. God never walks away from us. And that's why God says he doesn't operate on feeling. The reason why you serve God is because you made the choice to serve God. It's times where I don't feel like reading the Bible, but I still got to force myself to pick up the Bible and read. Times I don't feel like to pray, but I got to force myself to pray. Yeah. Times I don't feel like going to church, but I got to go to There's times I don't feel like spending any time with God, but I got to. You don't go off a of feeling because your feeling could take you downstairs instead of upstairs. Your yeah. feeling could take you in a wrong direction because you felt that way. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And the choice overrides the feeling. So that's why God explains like God doesn't operate off of feelings. He operates off of the choice that you made because the choice that you make, you know, with a conscious decision, a conscious choice will always be the right thing to do as opposed to how you're feeling. Yeah. I think a lot of people, they feel that fire for God. They feel on fire for him right away when those miracles happen in their life. And much like us, you know, we talked about earlier when we first gave ourselves that dwindled, right? And we started thinking, oh, we're back in control. My life is good. And I find it interesting that a lot of us as humans and Christians, we want to give him the glory when everything is going right, but but forget to also give him the glory even when things aren't, are, aren't going right or we aren't as on fire for him. But those are still moments when he's with us, and we forget that. But I think it's something that, you know, we talked about baby Christians and champions of, you know, Christians. You learn that as you walk with God, you learn because you have to correction, recorrect yeah. yourself, restay disciplined, remake the choice. And we live in a world that is so sinful and we are surrounded by so many influences. And I have to ask you, you know, you are a part of Hollywood. I'm a big, you know, rabbit hole kind of gal. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you, what it, what is the atmosphere of Hollywood? Is it really as satanic as people say? Is that conspiracy theory? Is what, what, what is your input in your well, observation. Well, well, again, everybody's an individual case, mm-hmm. you know, but I will tell you what I'm stuck on lately. And I've been stuck on this lately the last year or so hardcore. Um, and I've been saying it on my Instagram and everything. What I'm stuck in now lately is this is what Hollywood has taught me. If you don't know someone personally or we're not involved in the situation personally, you don't know a damn thing about anything. Mm-hmm. All you know is what you were told and what's on front street. That's why, like, even when we do podcasts or interviews, radio interviews or magazine interviews or whatever, I care less, man, what anybody says now because I'm like this. I go, hey, I thank you for saying the right thing, Mm -hmm. but because I don't know you personally, I can't get behind you. Yeah. But I'll thank you for saying the right stuff. Thanks for that because getting to, quote, unquote, be behind the curtains, I know a lot of people that are being applauded for right now. And, yeah, yeah, but – if you knew him the way that I knew him behind the curtain, you might not be a fan. You might not be applauding the way you're applauding. And I've seen slimy of the slimiest stuff go down. And just so we're clear, there's slimy in any business. You work at Walmart, could be a doctor at a hospital, slime in every business. I'm talking about the business I've worked in, which is Hollywood. And so I say, if you get to know someone personally, or know a situation personally because you were personally involved, or know them personally, that's a blessing. And that you could talk for sure on because you were involved personally or knew them personally to know what it is that you're talking about. Anything else that you see, 
I don't know if it, even people now are watching stuff on tape questioning if it's true or not. Yeah. Even people nowadays. So, you know, the news, it's half true, half fake. Um, podcasts are half true, half fake. All this stuff, you know, that's why I say like, I'm so, that's why, and that's why you got to get to know God personally yourself because you need to know what God and God himself is telling you. Because if not, even the Bible says, watch out for false prophets mm -hmm. and all this stuff. That's Because there's some people out there, they come off so anointed and they got the Holy Spirit and they're God and they come off like, oh my God, everything that person says is right because it sounds right. But you got to remember that the devil himself says that there's a lot of people wise as a serpent and all that stuff or whatever. And if you don't know God's word personally, yeah. yourself, to know what God and God only is telling you himself, again, you can't be manipulated, deceived, or tricked. And so that's why, you know, I and I'll tell you where I first got that uh, revelation real quick. Also, one time I asked this pastor, I did an event before your podcast and I lost my voice and then oh, the weather okay. with the allergies killed me on top of that. You sound so hardcore. I'm, it's good. So I'm really here struggling. <laughs> I'm really here struggling trying you're to show good, you're good. that I'm not struggling. But <clears throat> I'll share this quick personal story. One time I asked a uh, pastor, I said, hey, um, you know, we're headed towards a cashless society. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you think about that chip? I go, in your opinion, being a pastor, I go, do you think it's a, uh, you know, the mark of the beast or what do you think? And he goes, um, well, I don't think that it's really the mark of the beast because he goes, I can't be tricked into salvation. He goes, no one can be tricked into salvation. He goes, if you surrender yourself to Jesus, he goes, Jesus knows that you surrendered yourself to Jesus. So by putting that chip in me, it's not going to um, take away how I think. Like I'm mm -hmm. still going to think the way that I think. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but I said, if they put the chip in you, which is activated as your credit card because cash your no longer because cash no longer yeah. exists, right? What do you mean your credit social score? Your, so in China, they've implemented uh, something like that. It's a cashless society, cashless system, but they also do a social credit score. So um, like you, but, but the bottom line media. is that everything's going to be operated off yeah. of that, correct? Yes. Right, and right. they can take, give things it, like that. You say the only, wrong thing, but only if you have the chip. Yeah. So my point is with that chip inside of you, there's going to be things that you can do and not do. Yeah. But if you do not comply with the government, which controls that chip, all they have to do is simply turn it off. And now you can't even go to Burger King and buy a cheeseburger. Yeah. You can't buy groceries. And in the Bible, it says very clearly that if you accept the mark of the beast, you will no longer be able to buy or sell goods or do business of any mm -hmm. kind. So I told him, I said, yeah, but if you take that chip, and you don't do what the government says and they turn you off, I go, you're under their control. And I go, so don't you see that as, you know, being the mark of the yeah, beast it's because it's the devil's world. And I go, you can't use cash. You, you know, you're gonna be able to wipe your butt with it. Yeah. I, he's like, and again, he went back to the same answer. He goes, well, again, it doesn't change my way of thinking. And he goes, because it doesn't change my way of thinking, he goes, um, he goes I don't really see that as being the mark of the beast. Yeah. Now, someone told me this later, and I was tripping. What if they put that chip in you and it does something to you? You don't know if that can mess you up physically, yeah. mentally, handicap you. You don't know what effects yeah. it could have by implementing it in your skin. But anyways, here was my whole point. When I left that conversation that day, I never forget. I was in my car. And I go, that's why I got to know God personally yeah. myself. Because yeah. I got to know what God's telling me. Yeah. Yeah. Not this guy, this guy, or that guy. If, I, if, if God himself doesn't tell me himself to take that chip, which I don't think he will. I, I'm not taking the yeah. chip. And at that point, like the Bible says, we get our heads chopped off. And you got to remember, in the last days, the Bible was very clear. If you mark yourself as a Christian, you're putting yourself out there to be killed. Yeah. You're pretty much marking yourself as death. And that's what's going to scare people. People are going to not proclaim the word of God because they don't want to die or get their head chopped off. Yeah. And and when you know who you're dying for, I don't care. Yeah. And what's going to happen? They're going to make you look like a 5150 Section 8 case. They're going to say, you're crazy. You're talking about God, this alien in the space who don't exist. And they're going to come at you all. Lock her up. Yeah. She's saying wild stuff. But you know what's going to happen? Then you get locked up like the Germans did to the Jews. They're going to be like, hey, all these people are in jail. 
We're wasting food on them. We're housing them. They're taking a lot of our resources. But no matter what we do, they're still claiming God and they won't shut up mm-hmm. about God. You know what? Kill them all. Yeah. Yeah, much like what is it, the disciples that, that passed away and were stoned to death and exactly. all that. They, they died for what they believed in. And I call that spiritual discernment. You got to have spiritual discernment. And even you, you know, we touched about. And I'm not going to lie. I'm sorry to cut you off. Just to say this. It's going to be scary. There's going to be some moments where like, damn, man, I'm dying for you, God, like this. But all right. Yeah. Because I know where I'm going. But if if you're really dying for God, you just got to do what you do. And 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 I feel like I'm not as scared as I I thought I would have been. But I think it's because I know that God wins. He's, he's going to win. The battle is won already. You know yeah, what I remember, mean? Remember, they'll, get, you know, they'll and get the seven years on the and world. And even the way that I look at death, to me, death is a, it, you're born into another life. You're born, you know, it's your it's your spirit life. And that right. goes on. This is just the flesh vessel, you know? Right. But I like what you said about spiritual discernment because even with me and the podcast and growing, you know, in every, every avenue, every endeavor, there's a grit side. <laughs> there's a slimy side. And... I keep, that's like one of the main things I keep praying for. I'm like, Lord, please continue to give me spiritual discernment because there's been a few situations that I've been in where I'm like, okay, I'm learning the hard way. And my husband, he's a little bit more, um, I give a little bit benefit of the doubt more and I'm more, you know, positive and he's more like, nah, he could see all the like, mm -mm." he, he just, you know, he has that discernment. And it's uh, it's tricky. It's hard, and it's, it makes me a little nervous. I'm not even gonna lie. I get a little bit nervous the more that I grow, the more that my podcast, the more I network, the more I'm like, okay, I need to be very discerning of the people and the opportunities and intentions, and keep my heart grounded to what I know to be true, which is God. And and so long, I truly believe, so long as my focus is on Him, everything will work itself out. Even this conversation. You know, like even Joey messaging me and being like, hey, this is an opportunity. Would you like to talk? And I'm like, what are the odds that that would happen in this whole time? I'm like, I'll probably never have a big name or I'll probably never, you know, it'll be for the people that hear it. And even with just one who hears testimony and is transformed or questions and has that curiosity in them, I'm good. But to know that I'm here speaking to you. We're speaking about things of substance, things that aren't getting talked about enough. You know, you're touching topics that are like this gets people, quote unquote, canceled, which I don't even believe in the canceling. I don't believe in none of that. You know, I think it's going to platform you even more, but it's wonderful. I'm, I feel like I'm really seeing God's work and people being on fire for him and doing it fearlessly like you're doing. And I love to see it because two years ago, I don't know what the heck was going on. <laughs> people were way scared to speak up and speak out. People were scared to lose followers and their businesses and being <laughs> liked. And I'm like, I was like, hell no, then don't like me then. And honestly, the way that I looked at it was like, all right, cool. I lost hella followers, but I cultivated the the ones that see what's up. And it's what is it? What is the saying? It's better to be surrounded by have a quarter than a hundred petties. Well, that's, I, that's I, how say, I, look at I it. say I'd rather have one real friend than a hundred fake ones. There you go. But I'd rather have uh, quality over quantity. There you go. So that's the quality other thing too. Quantity. You know what I'm saying? You gotta. I don't care about the people who don't fo- look. The truth is, man, it was when you're when you're too real, you will be alone. (laughs) You will. You won't be liked by very many. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, it is what it is. Like I said, when you know who you're dying for, who you're standing for, who cares? At the end of the day, who knows? One day they might get zapped by someone else. Yeah. That, you know, it wasn't you. And they come back and say sorry yeah. and be like, I didn't see it the way you saw it. I've had two that happen ago. a few times, actually. Yeah, I've had that happen, too. And that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. But the bottom line is, if they're not meant to be in your life, they're not meant to be in your life. If they're not meant to be on your podcast, they're not meant to be on your podcast. You know, I um, have been very careful about who I share my personal business with, who I let in, who I don't, et yeah. cetera, et cetera, things like that. Because you have to. Because nowadays, you know, you got to know who you know, who you know, that you know, who you're sharing your business with and what you're talking about. But I'm on a page right now where I just don't care, man. I I consider myself, like I said, the Tupac of Christianity. I'm tired of playing it safe. I'm tired of conservative Christianity, tired of people pleasers, people speakers, people talkers that just want to like not hurt feelings, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like me, I'm going to say it the way it is. And if you hate me for that, then so be it. I can care less because you weren't meant to be in my circle. And I'm not going to lie. I'm I'm losing jobs over this in Hollywood. I got I I had some I did some big thing on, uh you know you could go back and look at my post. I did some big thing on the LGBTQ community. Yeah. 
And um, but I said it as safely and politely as I could. I, yeah. I got no judgment. With your, with I got your no thing, judgment. Yeah. I just said, if you're born a woman, there's no question. You're a woman. If yeah. you're born a man, you're born a man. There's no question. You know, there's no in between. Yep. And I wasn't like for that. So, but yeah. I can care less because, you know, what they're doing is mutilation. Yeah. You know, if, if you hear what they're doing to women to change them into a man, they shave the insides of their legs yeah. to fold and make a, a penis. Yeah. And it, this is where it's going. That's mutilation. Yeah. That's not, it's, it's disgusting what's happening out there. Yeah. And there's so many people who have had sex changes and then regret it once they become the other. Yeah. And I'm sitting here like, I, I was trying to save you before you went that deep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And people, the information's out there, too. I feel like a lot of people don't want to go look, but I, I like to focus on the numbers because that's where facts over feelings, right? Um, and it is the rise in detransitioners that has happened. My heart goes out to them because I feel like in many ways they're taking two hits. They took a hit physically, right, when they were being misled. And, what I, and they're taking a hit again for standing out and talking about how they were misled and then being freaking, uh, you know, demonized because of it. When this is, they live this, and they're they're like the living proof of how it affected their lives, and we're discrediting them because they're not aligning with whatever the mainstream opinion or perspective should be, and uh, it sucks to see a lot of people that are lukewarm and don't want to say what you said and do it. What, like I, what that. I'm trying <clears throat> to let them know is that you know there's no judgment, there's no hate. Christians don't hate gays or lesbians or transgenderism or any of that stuff. We don't. There's no hate at all. It's yeah. it's just trying to direct you to do it God's way instead of your way. You yeah. know, and, and and Jesus said, you know, they don't hate you. They hate the Jesus inside of you. Yeah. It just is what it is, man. But at the end of the day, you got to be true to yourself, true to God. And at the end of the day, I'm going to have to answer to God, not yeah. you, not her, her, him, you know, not whoever. Like, I'm going to have to answer to God. Yeah. So and, and I even told my own daughter this as much as this is hard to hear. There's not one person in this world worth going to hell over, not even my own daughter. And I told her that to her face. I said, you're my daughter. I love you. I will do anything in the world for you. But at the end of the day, to make that decision to go to heaven, it has to come from you, yeah. not me. So I go, I'm not even going to hell for you. On earth, I'll do whatever I can do. Yeah. But I'm not going to hell for you or anybody because not one person on this earth is worth going to hell over, not even my own kids. Yeah. So, you know, I, I told her, you it's know, like when, an when Abraham he, story right there. I was like, hey, whatever, right? <laughs> I know. Like, yeah, that's but like hey, a, hey, but God said, woo! stop. He said, yeah. stop. But he tested him and took it to the limit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But that but, was a true test of faith no, right there, I, man. That's, that's what, was, what I'm saying. Like, but Abraham was committed. And that's why yeah, God man. was like, all right, I trust you. Slow yeah. down. But God will always make a way out where you saw no way out. But the one thing I tell people is what they have to understand is that you're going to stand before God alone. It's mm -hmm. not going to be you, mommy and daddy. It's not going to be you and your best friend. It's not going to be you and a priest. It's just going to be you and God. And you have to answer for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I tell people, man, like, I hope you make that decision to you know, accept them into your life and make them a part of your lifestyle. Because if not, that's going to be a rough road and, you know, good luck to you. Yeah. Well, Noel, I appreciate everything that you've said on the podcast before we fully wrap up. What is the biggest thing that you've learned from life that you want people to know? When I was younger, um, I should have listened more. I should have took more guidance. You know, I should have uh, had more of a open heart to wiser people, you know, and, um, what I tell people all the time, it's funny because, you know, you know what you do when you uh, listen to people? You bought yourself time to be heard when it's your turn to speak. Mm. And so, you know, I, I, I didn't know. I was a hothead when I was younger. I thought I knew it all. You couldn't tell me nothing because I was the, you know, big badass in the street and I couldn't be the one to be told. And, and I wish I would have, you know, just learned how to navigate better with different people and talk to them to yeah. gain wisdom and gain knowledge that I could have had when I was younger. But because of my stubbornness, you know, I was, I had to learn the hard way. I had to go to jail to figure it out. Not once, but a couple times I had to get arrested a lot to figure it out. I had to, you know, get into these situations that I got into that I could have avoided mm -hmm. by not listening. You know, I made my life harder on myself because of all the wrong decisions that I made. So if I was younger, 
and I would have made conscious decisions instead of unconscious decisions, I could have made my own life easier. But I made my life harder on myself because of the foolishness and all the crazy and the wilding out I was yeah. doing. So, and then the other thing I would just say, what I want everybody to know is like, you know, it don't matter where you're at, where you've been, who you are right now. God loves you. God just wants your personal time. And I'll end with this. This is what people don't understand the most. A lot of people want to be blessed, but they're living their life out of order. God cannot bless disorder. Mm -hmm. Everyone's living crazy and wild, but they want the blessings of God. Mm -hmm. The reasons why you're not getting the blessings of God is because God cannot bless what's out of order. Yeah. He can only bless what's in order. So when you get to know God and the more and more that you put your life together a piece at a time and there starts being order in your life, that's when all the blessings will pour in. And I tell people like this, that's when you don't got to go. Because a lot of people in life, we chase the blessings of the world mm -hmm. instead of the blesser. Yeah. But if you chase the blesser first, the blessings of the world, they come chasing you. You don't got to go chasing them. Yeah. So. A hundred percent. I agree with that. And I always say, keep your focus on him first and everything else aligns. Exactly. You know, as a woman in my, my family, it's God first. Before anything, my husband, my kids. I know a lot of people no, are wrong with that too, but that's exactly I, how it is. It's just, and, that, and that's why, why and that's household. why it's not our way. It's God's you know? way. God is all God is is our creator and a loving father who is guiding us and telling us the best way to live our lives because as a loving father slash creator, he knows best. Mm -hmm. But he loves you so much that he will let you decide whether or not you want to be obedient or not. Mm -hmm. And that is why, as he said earlier, the choice is always yours. Don't ever think that you don't yeah. have a choice you do. And the fruits of the choice that you make will show or yeah. lack thereof. Well, your lifestyle will show, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all figuring it out. You know, I don't know everything. Even when I die, I won't know it all. You know, again, as corny as it is, it's a journey. It really is a journey. Yeah. You're going to have your ups and downs, your, you know, your battles, whatever, but... It's how you overcome them. Hopefully you learn from your mistake and that betters you forward. And uh, this is the way I say it. It's better to be in this fight with God than without that God. Is, amen. You know what I'm 100%. So I say instead of keeping a gangster, keep a godster. There we go. That's, I used to be a gangster for the world. Now I'm a godster for Jesus. See, and I always, so, I refer to myself as a spiritual thug. And I'm always like, yeah, I get through the things because it's the G in me. God. That's, that's what's up. I, <laughs> I literally have a whole video saying that because it's true. I mean, people be like, that's corny. And I'm like, well, whatever. It's true for me. Like, no, it's all you know, that's take good. it how you want. But I went from hood to holy. So that that's is good. my testimony. And oh, can't good. no one take that from See, me. God you know? gave me that. A hundred percent. Well, Noel, thank you. No, it's love. It's love. For yeah, being for here. Me. I love this conversation. Um, I enjoy it very much. And peace out, everybody. Yeah, I hope and, that you guys uh, enjoyed. Follow me on my Instagram if you want to keep up with me. Actor Noel G. Actor Noel G, one word. And uh, much love. And my last words will be this. God first and the rest will work itself out. Much love. Amen. All right.